There we go. And it is streaming. Okay, so maybe it is streaming. Good morning. I don't know if, um, if you, okay, and there it is. There it is, me acting a knucklehead. Hi, good morning, good morning. Welcome to you. I am, um, I am actually still straightening up my desk. Um, you know, sometimes my desk gets a little messy and um, I try to keep it pretty straight. Um, and since I'm here at it all the time, I don't like getting distracted by stuff. So I do have to do a little bit of straightening sometimes in the morning. And usually I get to do that as I talk to my darling Stephanie. Um, but it is, um, nonetheless, I am here. So I am happy to to see you guys here, to see you here, to see you. Um, so good morning, good morning, good morning. And um, I'm really, I'm, I'm excited about all of this stuff. I, I wanted to um, talk about some of the things that I have talked about to, to do sort of like a recap and then move on into um, the next section of um, this work and um, just, yeah, just, just get it done. So I'm so happy to be here. I, yesterday, um, <sighs> sometimes, sometimes, uh, yesterday I had, um, I had a good day yesterday. I was, um, I, I participated in a meeting after I finished with my, um, with my Sunday broadcast and then um, went over a friend of mine's house for dinner and um, just, just, a, you know, cool laid back kind of a, a weekend and I hope that you had a great weekend too whatever that means for you I don't always know what that means for other people but um for me I try to have um the consistency of having certain things in place on a regular basis and so my morning since my mornings are pretty much the same every morning I I you know wake up at 4.30, go outside, I do my exercise, I come in, I do my meditation, I do some writing, and then I um, show up for this. And so all the way up until about 8.30, my mornings are pretty consistent. Um, next weekend, because it is a holiday weekend, it may be a little different, and we'll talk about that as we get closer to it. But nonetheless, this is... Um, that it I have to be have to tell you guys that we are working out of anatomy of the spirit because I did run into somebody this weekend that said you know I see you online every day when I wake up and what are you guys working on what are you talking about <laughs> and so um and then too what I also realize is is that the what I see on my end is not at all like, I don't know if other people, when they do Facebook live, how they are able to see people as they come on or as they're watching or whatever. Cause I, oh, is that Stephanie coming in? Hi, good morning. Hi. How oh are you? my gosh, hi. Hi. Welcome back. Thank you. How are you? I'm tired, um, but I'm good. I feel good. Okay. Yeah. How was um? How was your trip? It, um, it was good. It was. We're, we're, I'm already on Facebook Live, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was good. It was a lot. It was. It was a lot. A lot of work. Oh. It's hard to leave. Hard to come back home. Um. Cause there's just so much to do and uh, not enough time and 
really needed to be there during, to me, business hours uh, where we could make a couple of business calls, but we got to do all that kind of stuff today. And today is when I see patients back to back to back. So it's going to be interesting today. So, yeah. Well, okay. Well, I've been sending you some good vibes. And Thank some you. Prayers. I have been feeling the good vibes. Um, I have been very um, step backish, if you will, being the observer as opposed to the doer. I let my siblings pretty much do everything and I just listened a lot and uh, felt a lot and um, just paid attention to the energy in the space that I was in the whole time. And even since I've been home, um, so yeah, thank you. I, I've been feeling um, strong in everything. Um, it's a new role for me, the mm -hmm. role of the observer, because mm. my natural instincts is to be a doer. Um, that's what I'm typically, I want to do. I want to have everything in process. I want to have it. And uh and I didn't call, to, I didn't feel, I don't feel called to be that in this circumstance. So, okay. yeah. Okay. Well, good, good. And, um, and so I find it very uh, also interesting and intriguing, juicy, that this is a first root chakra kind of tribal dynamic for you. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so to be able to be conscious about that through this is just um, an amazing opportunity. It is so yeah. good. Yes, yes, it's yes. So, it's just so good. It's almost like giving birth to something new, but at the same time, having the new thing here and nurturing it at the same time. Hmm. Okay, good, good, good. So, um, so I just went through, I'll, I'll catch you up over Thank the you. last, I was hoping you could do that. <laughs> yeah, over the last few days, I have made, um, we have made our way through the first chakra stuff where we talked about loyalty. Um, then we talked about this idea of honor, which, you know, which I think is, yeah, I think is so powerful. And, and now we're, um, you know, I started justice yesterday and, um, was kind of planning on finishing up justice today and before we move into the second chakra stuff. But I will say that there has been like, even just yesterday, so much that came up for me around this idea of justice when, it's, um, when it relates to um, family stuff and how we, how we process and how we engage, um, even stuff from, from the playground came up for me, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what sometimes is so interesting. The stuff that when, you know, when you start thinking about it, the stuff comes up, the time you come home from school and, you know, when you're telling your mother about who did what to you and then the questions, the fallout from that, you know, well, what did you do? Um, <laughs> you know, did you get them back? Did you, did you tell somebody, you know, it became that kind of stuff. And, um, and what we learn through that, one of the things, and I, and I think I've shared this before here is that my mother, I used to often hear my mother say, and my mother had, like, like I was telling, I, I don't know if you were on here, but I was talking about how my mother used to babysit. And so we had all these, we constantly had not just extra children in the house, but women who were either dropping off or picking up. Okay, and they yeah, always yeah. seemed 
yeah, they always seem to want my mother's advice, you know, because she just seemed to be that woman, which she was, you know. And so she would have like little things, little quips that she would say to people. Um, and, and one of which my mother was this woman out of Mississippi. Like when you go down to where she was raised, she, there's the red clay dirt, Mississippi, where. Where um, I just came from. <laughs> Not uh, Mississippi, yeah. but the red clay dirt. Yeah. But, but it was a place where you pulled your own weight. You know, it wasn't like you were sitting back, you know, so, so my mother was, was a strong woman. I mean, I say that to say that she was, you know, in, in her own right and um, very uh, Aries. So she was like, um, almost like you, you would think of her like a bull. She was not one that you can move. It was when you ran up against her, you ran up against a force. So, um, you know, she would, she would have these conversations with, you know, these women and my mother said, she was often heard to be heard to say, I have told my husband, she called him Herman. That was his name. She says, I told him if he ever hit me, he better kill me. Cause if he don't, when I get up, I'm going to kill his ass. Right. That was her like period in the story she gonna handle it whatever it was and so I came up with that kind of ferociousness around me as far as the 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 how how things were dealt with like we didn't see that kind of stuff as kids because my parents just didn't play you know it was we all nicey nicey we church folks but yeah, this ain't this ain't gonna be something that's gonna wrap on. We gonna handle whatever it is, and it's done. Mm -hmm. And so when when um, in here they talk about um, this idea of what a sense of justice that people come up with, um, it just puts me in mind of of the lessons or the things that that we heard over and over again um, as far as how families deal with justice. And in here, she's, she uses the example of an eye for an eye um, and, and different things like that. So, so, when, so when this stuff comes up for me, um, yeah, it was this this whole sense of this justice, these ideas around that were were something that was really powerful and was bringing up um, times at which I felt as if I wasn't um, I wasn't a fierce defender, not because I did not see it, but because um, at times I thought that and I'll give you this example so so when um the time when I talk about often that I was raped um when I was younger I remember I kept thinking to myself the whole time it was happening this can't be happening mm -hmm. this can't be happening this is this this dude he ain't trying to hurt me that was that was my that was my processing so i really could have i, I really could have responded differently but i didn't because i kept thinking what is, you know i was i was i was caught in that un yeah, but you know how, how, and if you had it all to do all over again, you probably <laughs> would have fought like your life depended on it. But because you, because it's somebody, you know, one, and because you, you're kind of like, and, and so once this, once this happened, it's like, you're kind of like dazed and thinking like, what? 
you know, it, it was just one of those things. So, so that kind of stuff comes up, that kind of stuff comes up. And then the forgiveness work of, of, um, of saying that I did the best that I could in the moment where I was with, Mm -hmm. with the awareness that I had. So, Mm -hmm. so all of that stuff has been coming up. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Really good work. Yeah. Yeah. Good work. I gotta grab my glasses. I'm sorry. I'm doing like this. Okay, no worries. I should have asked you because you know that's what we do all the time. We go through this morning thing of, of um, you got your glasses, you got your water, you got this, you got that. So um, it's all good. Oh my god. Yeah. Normal, whatever that is. Uh, so. Hmm. Oh, yes, God. Yes, yes, yes. Right. So, oh. so anyway, um, so yesterday I left off, um, and and so once you get open up your book, um, I, I know you have some stuff that may be highlighted that I haven't addressed or um <laughs> or that you yeah or that you think you want to um kind of revisit in in these sections before we kind of move on to uh, that second chakra stuff and there's so much that I want to um I've, I've been stuff that's coming up for me and I don't know like, I'm just hoping that this is healing for other people. But for me, this is just amazingly, um, even as we, even as I embark on this for like, and I've told people over and over again, I've read this book at least four times. And this time when I'm reading through it, I am finding stuff that I didn't highlight it, highlight because it wasn't my issue at the time. Exactly. So, yeah, so when, so even when we get into the second chakra stuff, I see that none of the stuff about menopause was ever highlighted. And I'm thinking, <laughs> that makes sense. And yeah. as I was thinking, I was thinking, you know, I'm not going to just, you know, randomly popcorn the stuff that I highlighted because at the time that I highlighted it, it had its own emphasis for me. Mm-hmm. And if we're not having a discussion about it, I can't put them together. So it just be kind of random. So I'll just keep moving forward with where we're going in the space where I did highlight to see if it resonates or if it's, or our conversation becomes an affirmation for the stuff that I, that I already highlighted okay. moving forward. Because when I, things that I highlight after the fact, I'm just like, what did that mean for me? Or, or should I have even shared that? Like, you know, so I, I just have gotten used to being able to say, yeah, that's what I highlighted it for, for then, for that moment. And, um, and definitely where I am today, this whole, uh, I am chakra is yeah. really, um, it's pretty intense, um, on so many levels. I, I don't know what an essay is per se, like if it's an essay or a book, <laughs> but there is some stuff that I need to say about this whole I am chakra. And I'm like, I'm ready to say it. I'm like, I'm ready to go on vacation just to write about it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and the I am chakra is so very powerful. My brother just tuned in and says, I'm not up to speed. What's the book? And so it is Anatomy <laughs> of the Spirit, Derek. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Uh, so, um, so yeah, it is um, that that I am is is an amazing, amazing, amazing. Yes, yes, yes. But, but so too are all of them. I oh, mean, yeah. Because you know, mm-hmm. because for each they each have something that if we weren't paying attention just to shine a spotlight on it, like we're doing, you know, take a, take a, a flashlight out and shine a, a spotlight on it. It has something interesting and amazing. So um, I, uh, whenever I uh, go through and I talk about some of this stuff, it is, is really interesting to me because um 
yesterday when I talked about, there was a guy that she mentioned in this book, Patrick, who was involved in the military, who was living this kind of like secret life of, mm -hmm. of his military stuff that he was doing. And he didn't think that she would be able to see that in his energy field. And mm -hmm. when she called him on it or said something about it, it was immediately like, whoa, let mm -hmm. me back up. And now I got to exit because um, she's, she's accessed that part of me that's hidden. Mm -hmm. Um. Mm -hmm. And so, so I was thinking about it in terms of one time I used to, so, so, and my brother is on here, right? So my brothers had, I, I don't want to say they got me into this, but I used <laughs> to drive a taxi cab at one time mm -hmm. and it was because all my brothers drove taxi cabs and, and it was a quick way to make some, a hustle, a quick hustle. You can go out and make some money real quick. Um, or make them some money real quick and and be done with it, right? You don't have to worry about all of that stuff. Just whenever you want to, you go down, get you a taxi cab, drive around, make a little money, go on about your business. Anyway, um, one night I was driving. Sometimes I would drive on these weird nights, like a Sunday night or something like that. And you pick up people either at the airport or some other um, some other way. I've had some amazing trips that have been life altering, you know, um, people sharing stuff with you that has been crazy. But one particular night, one Sunday rainy evening, um, a guy gets into my taxi cab and he doesn't want to sit in the back like he, you know, like you're supposed to. He wanted to sit up front. Mm. And so he gets in. And I was like thinking to myself, okay, you know, I picked him up at the airport. He's not really carrying any luggage, you know, he's got a bag with him, like a duffel bag, but I'm thinking nothing of it. Like, okay, you know, fine. You can sit up here. It was not necessarily comfortable for me, but it was like, okay, whatever. Right. And, um, and I was driving a minivan. So it was, it was a bucket seat but still he's up in my space. And so um, we're, you know, we're driving and I was, you know, trying to ask him questions, but there was a, a hardness about him that was kind of like, like I was just talking about my mother, like that kind of a, a, a hard force about him that was just seemed like it was immovable. So I was like, you know, um, just getting back into town or you know, what was the question? Um, it was something like, um, like, are, is this home or are you visiting kind of thing? You know? And he's like, no, I live here. I'm just coming back home. Okay. So, you know, out of town on business or pleasure, you know, kind of, you know, just making small talk. And so finally this man says to me, he was, you know, I asked him, I said, he said business. So I said, so what do you do? And he says, I kill people. I couldn't, <laughs> I, I, I could not breathe. I, and I said, like a hit man? <laughs> he said, yes. <laughs> He didn't really even turn his head to look at me. I was, girl, I, I was hyperventilating over there. I couldn't breathe. I was just sitting there like, oh my gosh. You know, so here I am and I'm riding along for another five, 10 minutes. And I'm just like trying to think to myself, like what the hell? Huh? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm having one of those moments. And he finally looks at me and he says, there is no money to be had in killing you. And I was I just thinking like, you wasn't an assignment, so don't worry about it. I was like <laughs> thinking to myself like, should I be offended by that? <laughs> <laughs> but, but it, you know, so, so when... <laughs> When I was thinking about this example that she gave of this man who, you know, who thought that, you know, nobody could tell that he was living this, this, this different life. And that some of the issues that came from what he was experiencing or what he was doing came from this lifestyle that he was leading 
um, the, the tightness and his inability to heal and all of that stuff came directly out of what he did in his life and, and how he flowed his energy. And so when I think about this, hey, Pam, when I think about this, I think about, um, you know, that, that same thing. A lot of times we don't recognize that our health is impacted by the things that we do, and especially by things that we do that we think are hidden mm -hmm. that other people can't see. Like triple underscore, especially the things yes. that we yes. think are hidden. Those are the cancers, the little cancers that eat away at our psyche, the energy systems, and yeah, it's, it's the things that, yeah, it's those things that we think are hidden that are the ones that pour forth. And they're also the ones that people quickly be like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so, good, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so in the section, um, and 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 the 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 interesting thing about that is is that sometimes it is such a big part of our personalities that we can't break with it even though we realize it may be killing us but there is such an um you know such an identity that we have that we have merged with whatever our clandestine um secret stuff is 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 such a part of us that that it becomes one of those things that we find it hard to break away from. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah. So it, I love how she says down at the bottom of page 124, she says the ultimate first chakra lesson is, is that only the only real justice is divinely ordered. Mm -hmm. the only Real justice is divinely ordered, and um, and so you know a lot of times people think that they going they're going to go out and do the vengeance, you know, or or take some kind of 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 act on their own. But even in that, you know, there is this tendency for us to. Mm, To think that that just getting back at somebody is the resolution and it is not always. And, and we can't see the blessing that may be in what actually occurred. So we're looking for um, retribution when there is really, yeah, we just, just, we can wait. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this understanding is, is interesting. It really touches home for me. So, mm -hmm. okay. So, um, so let me just do this. Um, so on 125, she talks about the, mm -hmm. the, Judas, Judas. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, the Judas experience and um, the way she explains it is really interesting. Um, but she was talking about a woman who presented and she saw the image of the crucifixion. And um, she saw the image of the crucifixion, but then she went directly to Judas, which I found very interesting. When I see the, because to me, those two carry different energies. As a matter of fact, the, the crucifixion is different from the Judas um, thing. And I wonder- The betrayal? What... Yeah, well, so is she talking about that in terms of, of betrayal? Y'all, I'm, I'm sorry, we are just kind of like, um, I know I'm not being my normal self for the moment because I am, um, What's your normal self? I don't know. I don't <laughs> like, know. what are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know. I am. I don't know. Okay, so I don't see Judas in there. What you looking in? What I'm looking in her Sacred Truths book. Oh, for the archetype. Oh, okay. Okay. 
Um, and I thought that maybe I could see a Judas archetype in here and I do not. Let me check my. I see judge and then um, I don't see. So, so I don't recall Judas. Judas. Huh? I don't recall a Judas archetype, like in the cards. Any? Is not. Yeah, I don't see one in here. And the archetype of the crucifixion, um, I don't see that either. So that's really interesting. Hmm. So anyway, but but here, let me let me say what she says here. So she she had a woman who she said was filled with cancer. And mm -hmm. as receiving, um, as I was receiving an impressions from her, I saw the image of the crucifixion. Now, usually when I think of the crucifixion, I I think of, and I don't want to say the martyr, but it could be, we can just put it down as the martyr, somebody who is willing to die for um, the, the sins of the world. So let me, let me see if I can find this martyr archetype. Um, cause I know that that is one. Um, within the self-help field, shadow martyr shows a person who has learned to utilize a combination of service and suffering for others as a primary means of controlling and manipulating yes. environment, right? Ironically, yeah. the social and political world, the martyr is often highly respected for having the courage to represent a cause, even if it requires dying for that cause for the sake of others, suffering so that others might be redeemed, whether the redemption takes a spiritual or political form is among the most sacred human acts. Um, while people recognize this archetype in others, particularly when they are direct uh, directly influenced by the individuals sporting this pattern, they often cannot see it in themselves. And so, um, so when I think about the crucifixion, I think about the martyr. Um, when I think about 30 pieces of silver, I think about Judas. I mean, hmm. you know what I'm saying? So she said that she saw that um, and so immediately she said the image was connected not to her religion, but rather to her feelings of suffering mm -hmm. from a Judas experience. Okay, so from a Judas experience. So she had been betrayed, betrayed um, the challenge, okay, of healing from a profound betrayal. Okay, mm -hmm. so now... Uh, okay, I'm back. I'm yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> so as I pondered the meaning of this image, she says, I realized that the Judas experience is an archetype. It conveyed the meaning that human reasoning and justice always fail us at some point and that we do not have the power to reorder events in our lives and remake all things according to how we would want them. The lesson of a Judas experience is that putting faith in human justice is an error and that we must shift our faith from human to divine authority. <laughs> Trust that our life is governed by divine justice, even though we cannot see it. Okay, so then absolutely. So that follows. Okay. Because, because for me, when she was, when they, when she said, okay, so you got where I was with the crew. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and so, uh, so I want to introduce a little story for us to chew on, because as we move into this relationship thing, um, I, I, I got it, I got a little story for you, and, um, and so maybe we can just chew on this as we go through, okay? Okay. Now, this, is, this is a true story, so I, I, I am not necessarily using the names of the people. Huh. I really don't know this guy anymore. I worked with him say 20 some years ago, uh, I would, I want to say in the early nineties. Um, so this is a real story. This, this friend of mine who seemed like average in every way, just the average Joe came in to work 
all the time on time, you know, had a wife and I, you know, I think they had kids. Um, and if so, probably, you know, whatever age they were, but, you know, just a normal, regular kind of guy, solid, right? Solid. Anyway, um, you know, he used to, he used to always be there first and he have his cup of coffee and, you know, nice guy, laugh, you know, real easy, just a good, good natured guy, right? Not somebody that you'd want to date, not somebody that's flirty or anything like that. Just a, you know, good, wholesome family kind of guy. Anyway, um, I started noticing that after a while, at some point, he started coming in and he looked like he was disheveled, you know, like mm. sometimes like he hadn't taken a shower, mm. um, like he hadn't been sleeping well. And so, you know me, I'm going to go up there like, so what's up with you, right? Ah, oh, Sandra. I think he used to call me Miss Sandra. Oh, Miss Sandra, I, you know, I'm, I'm just going through some stuff. Okay, so when you're ready to talk, you know, I'm always here. So then he comes up to my desk and he's telling me, he was like, I, I want to get your opinion. Okay. And he's like, so my wife's sister has been staying at the house for a while. Okay. And he was like, yeah, he was like, and, um, um, you know, he was like, at first, I, I really wasn't thinking anything of it because, you know, she'd be in there watching TV at night. You know, she just done. She she camped out in, you know, we got this TV room and 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 so that's where she sleeps. And she just camps out in there and she just watches TV or, you know, all night she in there watching TV. Oh, OK. And he was like, yeah, he was like, well, you know, he was like the first couple of times he says, I just go in there and you know, she'd be in there watching TV and I, you know, go to the bathroom and go on back to bed. Okay. Yeah. And so he said, and then um, she started watching TV and, and, and she ain't really have on no, no clothes, you know, sometimes. I was, oh, mm -hmm. that's interesting. He was like, yeah, he was like, so, you know, she was in there and uh, 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 really no clothes on and and so, you know, she, I look at her and she look at me and she just be rocking her legs. Like, you know, like he was like, I, I thought it was, you know, he was like first couple of times. It was like, it was, it was no big deal. He was like, but you know, he was like, uh, you know, she, she smile at me. Oh, okay. I said, and the TV is on and just nothing else. I said, um, I said, are you sure? That, that she was looking at you <laughs> you asked that i did i did i did i said you sure because because you know it's easy to see somebody and you think that they're looking at you but you not you really don't know that they're actually asleep right mm, okay because um, i that's what i that I, you sure <laughs> So then he, this is what he says. He says, so I, I figured it was an invite, you know? I mean, I, this was like- Look, Let me take my glasses off. What? Yeah, he's, he <laughs> said he figured it was an invite. And so he, one day he just kind of decided he was going to climb aboard. And he says that, that, he says, and she set me up. I said, what do you mean she set you up? He was like, as soon as I got on her, he was like, she going to clamp her arms and her legs around me and start screaming. And then when my wife comes running in there, she, ah, he's attacking me. He's on me. He was like, and so now I'm sleeping in the car. I'm kicked out of the house. He says, if my wife thinks that I did this. He says, when it seemed like she was offering. And, and, and so, so what did you see, yo? spot in this ass so <laughs> so in his mind you know this is what has been done to him mm -hmm. as opposed to taking responsibility for his actions now i am or a willing participant on this journey right here Wow. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I I suppose um <laughs> you know in in mm. wow. moving forward that you know thinking about that particular incident and talking about first chakra which is the tribal family of origin with um, these two sisters and then this you know the relationship chakra which is what you know in his thing and just kind of um just chewing on something like that and and the ways in which all of this kind of weaves its way in and out of the issues that we have here mm -hmm. so whether he felt like he was um uh, being crucified or whether he felt as if there was a betrayal. Um, his wife certainly felt like it, there was a betrayal. Um, whatever role the sister played in that, whether it, it was, a, you know, a totally innocent thing, we could sit there and talk about, well, you know, you know, why were you sleeping like that? We could talk about that, but, but who's to say that she was, you know, some people sleep with the television on, as you know. Right, right. Right. <laughs> that's how they sleep and so you don't know if 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 that is just their normal the only way that they can sleep and that they are actually sleep you know it becomes all of that um and so as we move forward i'm just uh i'm i'm just that's something that i you know we can chew on <laughs> mm. so um, so here, when she goes on from this, she says, we need to trust that we have not been victimized at all. I'm back on 125 mm -hmm. and reading. We need to trust that we have not been victimized at all. And that this painful experience is challenging us to evaluate where we have placed our faith. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, and so this story about this man, uh, Eric, who, um, who was at one of her workshops, um, wanted to have a conversation or not, he didn't want to have a conversation with her. He went to her workshop, really didn't participate. Um, but then at the end of the workshop, he offered to drive her to her next location which um, she was going from one European city into another. And he talks about how his business partners, he felt like his business partners had decided that they wanted to no longer be in business with him at the same time that his wife wanted a divorce. And so in his life, he was feeling this moment of total abandonment but he had a dream. And in that dream, he saw himself driving through the Alps. And he says that um, it, the, it was terrible. The conditions were terrible. And he thought that he was going to go off the road. And he talked about how nervous he was. And then he crossed the line. And it just seemed like all of the weather issues and all of the danger had just dissipated and disappeared. Mm -hmm. and that was his indication that said to him that you're going to go through some hell, but you're going to come out on the other end okay. And so he took that information and he went with it and changed his life all around. He used that dream to sort of pick out pieces in his life. And so that he could see the bigger picture and, uh, and knew that, that this was right where he needed to be just, just to be able to relax and know. And then he also, you know, made a declaration of if you are behind this. So he had already acknowledged that, that mm -hmm. there was something bigger or the possibility that there is something bigger happening here. It's like, if you are yeah. behind, you need to talk to me. Right. Well, and, 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 and I'm glad you said that because in the beginning of the story, he, it said that he started out an atheist, right? Um, um, yeah. yeah, I think it, it was that he started out, um, um,
Okay, so yeah, he said that. Yeah, even yeah. though I was an atheist. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, even though he was an atheist, he he still asked for for guidance. And immediately, yeah, that, I mean, well, you know, he had that dream and he knew, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, 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 yes, so wonderful, um, wonderful, wonderful guidance and a wonderful way of putting together his life based on that guidance that he received. So at this point in the book, um, something that is amazingly wonderful is, is that she ends up these particular chapters with these yes. questions for self-examination. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and these questions for self-examination are, are there to help us look more deeply. So in, in this section, her questions were, what belief patterns did you inherit from your family? Mm -hmm. and um and sometimes like 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 we've said before sometimes these these lessons are not necessarily like lesson one like you would get oh, in no school. they're not yeah they're not linear they don't they just kind of go yeah yeah they go in and out yeah. yeah and they grow they grow on each other and they actually depending on you know, where you are in your family of origin, they also can change. They also can be this. They're like, I don't believe that no more. You don't, you keep it to yourself. Mm -hmm. for a mm -hmm. season, and then after a while, you just say, I don't, I'm not, I'm not owning that. That's not my story. Right. But yeah, they come and they go and they grow and then they get dismissed. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and the other thing is, is sometimes one of the questions that I am, I, I like to ask people is, is what lessons are we teaching that we don't recognize or realize that we're teaching? Hmm. Like when, when I talk about my mother's fierceness, I don't know that that was a lesson that she was trying to teach me. Like, I don't know that she was saying, Sandy, you know, you got to stand up for yourself or you got to do this. But through example, through me listening, through the conversations that she had with other people and the ways that she conducted herself, that was exactly what I received. But now, say, for instance, you got other people in the house that may not have at all gotten that same thing or not responded in that type of way, right? Yeah, so I believe, and I don't know if it was kind of talked about in the beginning chapters, but if, if, if we are predestined to be in the families that we are in, I think that the parents that we choose or agree to come here and facilitate this experience with, I think that for me, my parents showed up for me for the stuff that I needed. And then for my sister, the, the same people showed up for an experience that she needed. And that's why you can have three kids in the same house and have a whole different experience. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. all three of us looking at the same two people going on, but we we perceive it and we take in and we get it so different. So yeah. what you needed to have for your journey from your mother, when she just simply poured out herself, you got what you needed. And then your sister and brother, they got what they needed and they have me have a totally different perception of of right. that experience. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think that that is just so beautiful yeah yeah <laughs> so when i when when they say it's a highly individualized curriculum yes oh, so, right so, yeah so that we get exactly <laughs> what we need um in order for us to get and be the people who we need to become yeah and so um so so i you know but but then okay so then too like say for instance um like these women that would come to my mother and have these conversations um, and my mother then kind of spilling out from her perspective of what it was that, that, um, that she thought. Right. Mm -hmm. and I remember it, it's so funny how the stuff sticks in my mind. Mount, so my mother was 
they're always married, right? Her entire life. She was married to my dad. Well, not her entire life, but you know. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> it probably felt like that for her. Huh? <laughs> I said, it probably felt like that for her. Yeah. Like, I've been, I've been a bishop longer than I've been, whatever her name was. Right, 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 <laughs> right, right, right. So, so it, was, it was so interesting because my mother was saying to her, she was like, she told this one woman, she was like, I ain't going to take no crumbs from some other man's table or from some other woman's table. And that's what she was like. You don't take crumbs from another woman's table like that. And so she's like sitting up there and I'm thinking to myself, what does that mean? What does that mean? So she was telling this woman this about this woman wanted um, a new bedroom set. And she was talking about complaining about her bedroom set. And she was like, he brings his married ass over there and she, he sleeps with you. She was like, put that bed out on the street. And the woman said, well, what am I going to sleep on? And she was like, you sleep on the couch. And she was like, so just put it out on the street. She says, that right. That's right. She was like, because he ain't going to do it on the floor. So if you don't have a bed there, he going to buy you a darn bed. And sure enough, <laughs> she got her new bedroom set. And so I'm just sitting up there thinking to myself, like, you know, like, <laughs> you know, she would have like, she would have all of it because people would come and they would talk about all kind of stuff. And so, uh, you know, yeah, it was always people that were having issues just like what we're talking about here. Um, one woman who um, she was babysitting her child um, comes in and she's all bruised up and, you know, battered up. And my mother is looking at her like, what happened to you? And she was, I think her husband's name was Isaac or something. And she was like, I saw Isaac with that woman in the car. And she was like, and so I, I got to the corner and I jumped on the hood. <laughs> Wow. She jumped on the hood of the car. And he gonna keep like gonna drive with his wife hanging on the hood of the car. And so she got tossed off the car. Oh. Girl, I was just like, she, my mother would, she would just look at me and she would get you. Because <laughs> I was totally intrigued by the craziness. I was just always trying to hear what they were talking about. I didn't want to go hear what, you know, play with no dolls or something. I want to hear what they're talking about. You know, and a woman getting tossed off of the uh, hood of a car. <laughs> that was just like, that. she used to have all kind of people coming in like she was doing your job. <laughs> yeah, she probably was. <laughs> like she was a therapist. It's like, <laughs> what, what, what's wrong with you? Jumping on the hood of some car. Crazy people. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry, I'm all back down this. So <laughs> the patterns that you inherit from your family, what belief patterns do you inherit from your family? And so these things can be something that have been verbal or nonverbal that, that you have either been directly taught or that you got or gleaned from information that you received or saw or something else, right? Which of those belief patterns still have authority in your thinking? Can you acknowledge that they are no longer event? Um, valid. Yes, that they are no longer valid. Mm -hmm. right? That's the secret right there. Right. That's the magic. Giving yourself permission and when you, you know, when you clear, get clear about loyalty, honor, and then the justice piece is saying this no longer has dominion. That's justice. That's justice for you, the individual and your individual curriculum. That's the justice. And mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that bad or wrong, it just doesn't fit, it wasn't for you. Right. right. And, not, and I don't say it so, you know, cavalier, but it, it is simply that. 
and that's where that loyalty piece comes in. Like we examine our loyalties and we examine the honors, but then the justice piece is standing up for me. Yeah. In the nope. who am I? I mm -hmm. am. You get to decipher all of that and distinguish and be clear about it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, what superstitions is the next question? What superstitions do you have, um, which have more authority over you than your own reasoning ability? Mm -hmm. Right. Do you have any superstitions? I used to think that um, if I think positive, something negative would happen. I don't, I used to think that. I used to be like, well, let me not do that. So I would think like the opposite so that what I want would happen. Oh. Um, I don't have that anymore, but that used to be a thing for me. Like, oh, you know, don't get too excited. Let's, you know, mm -hmm. um, but I'm trying to think if I have superstitions. Hmm. I have to think of none come straight to my head. That's for sure. Um, so mm -hmm. I will tell you, I will tell you that um, my dad used to have a thing about black cats. Don't cross the path of a black cat. And um, whenever I see a black cat, I am conscious of it. And I consciously, when I cross its path, I consciously do so. I think about it and then I do it anyway. Okay. Or splitting a pole. That was a super. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, uh, I, I don't pay attention to splitting a pole anymore, but I think about it. Yeah. That was my, I mean, I don't do it now, but I, that was a, that was a thing for me. Yeah. And black cats were a thing, but only if they were going to the left. Oh, okay. I never, but I, I had a black cat that. cross me to the left. They meet. They always cross me to the to the right. I guess because I had a superstition about don't want them to cross me to the. Even when we was driving to Alabama, the cats was going to the right, and I was to myself thinking, "And I'm in a car in Alabama, and the cat is going this way." Like it was just the thing <laughs> ever. <laughs> so that is a superstition that I have. <laughs> Erica typed in the window, window by humbug. <laughs> but, but I will say at New Year's, I do try to get a man to walk through my door. Oh, <laughs> I don't wash clothes on New Year's Day. <laughs> wow, that's but, interesting. Okay. But, but not because I know what it means, just is just, well, how difficult is it not to not wash clothes on New Year's? I have a thing that my house has to be spickety span clean. Ah, uh, yeah. At New Year's Day, like yeah. everything in order, gotta have a little stack of money on the table. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, what is the man on New Year's thing? Well, I think you have to have a man walk through your doorway um, first in the new year or else, you know, because I guess women are supposed to be bad luck. I don't know. Something like that. I don't know. By humbug for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but I mean, there are so 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 there's a lot of superstitions. Yeah. When you when you think about it, especially around the new year, because I still make black eyed peas. Yes, black eyed peas. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't eat the pork and all of that stuff, so I'm not doing all of that. But I black eyed peas and greens and probably some sweet potatoes or something mm -hmm. like that on New yeah. Year's Day because that was what was always done. So. Yes. So I guess I do. I I, do. I never okay. thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it just seems right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just <laughs> it's what, what we've always done. <laughs> I know that I, you know, a, a broken mirror is a broken mirror. Right. Um, I, you know, I don't have, I don't have a lot of stuff that quote unquote that I think that I do, but um, there are some things that I do <laughs> that, that bring you bad luck or give you 
dishonor you or something? Is that the superstition is the outcomes, right? That you are trying to avoid certain outcomes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and so then the next question she asks is, do you have a personal code of honor? Um, and oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So um, she said that never happened in my house. Um, isn't that a counter higher power? Isn't this counter yes, higher? It power? is. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And that's why she's pointing it out, though. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, it is. So, but 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 here's the thing. So for most people it is just the stuff that you've learned things that have been passed down to you stuff that you do um and i don't know that you even that it comes into a conscious thought that um yeah that it's saying that i'm putting my faith in you know, like, a, I think, is it Rastafarian who has, um, you know, you you can't enter someplace from the left, you got to enter from the right, you got to turn to the left instead of, I mean, they have all these little things as far as how you're supposed to, even when you're entering your home, you can't, you can't come from the left, you got to come from the right. Wow. Or, or walk all the way around a different way, just so that they're not entering from the left as opposed to the right. Um, just, just stuff that people do. Um, so, um, do you have a personal code of honor? And if so, what is it? And we're, while we're not necessarily asking the question for you to answer it here. No, get one, do one, develop it. Yes. Yes. It Mm. is something that, um, you know, you can, if you, if you feel so moved, um, to kind of write that down and evaluate it, um, mm-hmm. I think is insightful and helpful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Have, you, have you have you written one yourself or how many you- code of honors have I written? Um, I've written lots from so many different um, from so many different lifetimes. That's what I say in my lifetime for different reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, my code of honor now is that I will honor me and I, I will honor me and I will learn what that means because I have been under the subjection of my parents, religion, philosophy, psychology. Um, and so this last four and a half year journey has just been honoring who I am and what does that mean okay. for real? just yeah. who am I fully like fully like who did, where did I get that idea from and who said that that was the truth like I do that I do that for almost everything now um right. okay. on my journey to the point where actually this the stuff that I'm writing is about that it's about the questioning of myself the questioning of what I consider norm and how amazing my norm has changed as I've grown and um I humbly say evolve, but as I've grown and just become more, um, a really good friend of mine gave me this book about the, uh, the knight in the rusty armor. So as parts of my armor fall off, mm-hmm. there's this exposure of this, this, this being, this essence that is so cool. And so my one code of honor is that I will protect her and acknowledge her, um, Every, at, at every turn I will protect her and acknowledge her I will protect her yeah and acknowledge her that's good that's mm-hmm. big yeah mm-hmm. that's uh yeah that's big good yeah right. so there um, <laughs> yeah so have you ever compromised your sense of honor Mm -hmm. and who hasn't right Mm -hmm. if so have you taken steps to heal that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um 
And that too is an interesting question. It, it, to heal it or is it just in the doing the about face that we assume that the healing has occurred when you in just about, yeah and i believe in the about face the healing begins to take place right you're no longer putting dirt in it so it's no longer being infected and you start nurturing it so it starts to heal just like all the parts of our body like we've been designed to heal automatically so when you turn from some self-inflicted pain or pain inflicted by betrayal you turn from that and and acknowledge that and create your narrative or whatever declaration i believe mm -hmm. you start to heal from that as you move away from that experience you begin to heal and move into this new experience right so like let me let me address for a second the prostitute archetype for a minute mm -hmm. right? because there have been times when, and I think I've talked about this before, where we struggle with this idea of being up for sale, right? Mm -hmm. Ourselves, our time, um, all types of things. We have been um, a commodity and seen ourselves as a commodity. And then at a certain point, when that, when the power or the pool of money no longer has the draw for you, then you get to the point where you say, self, I'm done with that, right? And you turn and you walk away. And so then you recognize fully the next time somebody starts to dangle some carrot in front of your face and what that carrot represents, how big it is, how intoxicating it can be and whether or not you're going to accept that. And you become fully aware of it when you're doing it. Mm -hmm. So say for instance, um, you know, like the, the story about the boy who's, um, and the candy man that we talked about in here before. And I don't, were you, I don't know if you were here for that story when we shared it, but the little boy whose family had moved to this country and they needed some money, he started working for what they termed as the candy man. And the little boy was bringing in income to his house. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me. So the little boy was bringing in income. And so when he went and he told his mother that this candy man um, that he was going in and stocking the shelves for after school, when he told his mother that the candy man had been molesting him, they were like, they really needed that money. Hmm. And so he continued on working at that store and was feeling violated not only by the candy man, but also by his family who needed that money. And so there was, you know, that. So, you know, it becomes this thing of what authority does money and, um, you know, and, and needing to- Loyalty, make, honor. Yes, make other people happy what role does that now play in your life? And so when you no longer have that need to, um, you, you know, you, you, at, at a certain point, hopefully we heal that. We, we look at it and we recognize it for what it is. This is, oh, this is pulling on that prostitute archetype or this is pulling on my sense of worth and value. And then when you get to a, a place where, and it's not even because you now have more money, it is that I will no longer compromise myself based on money. And it, and it doesn't even matter how much it is or how much of a, you know, it doesn't even matter at a certain point. So, um, so that becomes things that we, after a while, we recognize it and then decide to no longer do it. Yeah. You know? and, and that could be whatever it is. The, um, the damsel in distress is a, is a huge archetype that many people occupy. They want to, you know, oh, I've fallen and I can't get up. And looking for somebody to come and rescue them. Yeah. And at what yeah. point it's do you... It's order in the DSM too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At what point do you figure out that that no longer serves you, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, I mean, there are so many of these that, that people struggle with and you've got to figure out how to get, how to, how, how to transform that energy. And the so compassion that, comes for me mm-hmm. is because it is an I am energy and it is the, it has come from the first gods of our lives. And, um, and so that we have been programmed or trained to be loyal to that and to be to honor that. And for me, the justice is the do not eat of this tree of knowledge, because then you get the knowledge of who I am. But that's the work that has to be done is that you create justice for you and not justice for us. So even though that first energy chakra is the family of origin, it's the tribal, but at the end of the day, the when the energy is in its full effect, it's an I am energy and pulling people and helping people to transform from the, the family tribal information, that young man who you know has said, okay, I'm gonna sacrifice my body and my time for my family. This goes against everything that is me. By the time you know he shows up and decides I'm going to get justice for myself, he's got to undo all of the messages mm-hmm. from all these years, and he has to like no longer be you know the savior for his family. It's so many things that you have to tear apart. Right, right, right. All in a form of dishonoring, in order to get justice for self, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and to resonate in that I am energy. Like that's just so big to me. Right. So, so wait a minute, let me, let me, um, cause, cause you said a, a couple of things in there that was what, that was really big. You said, um, the first gods of their life. Yes. And that's referring to his parents. Yes. Because that is this idea that, yeah, sure. our parents. Our parents are are all at yes. from the beginning. Right? <laughs> they're right. our food. They're everything. Our shelter. Right. 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 The other thing, um, and so, and so, when you say the I am energy, you were just talking about the how we define ourselves and how we see ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I, I'm sorry. I just wanted to. No, don't apologize. That's yeah. Cool. I just wanted to be clear so that um, so that yeah, we could uh, everybody could because uh, you know sometimes we just moving so fast. It's like mm-hmm. I, I I like to ask the questions before other people have to ask the questions. No. Okay. So um, so then the question becomes: Do you have any unfinished business with your family members? Mm-hmm. And I guess that was one of the things that triggered that story for me. Like, I don't know how um, my coworker, I don't know how this looks 20 years down the line. I don't know if him and his wife ever got back together, if he was totally and permanently ejected from the house. Because I remember him saying, now they living in the house that I pay for. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. her and her sister as if that um as if this was the goal all along like you know um to boot him out and then them to live in the house happily ever after together I don't know but but he kind of said that and alluded to it as if that was what he thought um the sister's aim was to kind of mm-hmm. trap him like mm-hmm. like a like a a, a, a mouse in a trap <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I believe and hope that he has woke up. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right. Please, because I can't imagine going your whole life like that. Well, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. I know it happens, but oh uh-huh. my. It's their yeah. fault. It's their fault I fell on top of her. Right. Uh, come on. <laughs> come on. And, and, you know, and I just, I sit there and I'm thinking to myself, God, you know, you can't be that dumb, right? And even if she was smiling at you and, and doing something, you don't just, you don't just end up like, oh, I'm going to just do a line, a a dive, and I'm just going to land in your stuff. That is not the way that it happens, right? You got to be pretty dumb to, 
to just no, dive over. Come from a family of origin where certain things are not like they, there's no loyalty and honor in that space. There's no clear cut. Choo -choo -choo. I don't know because there is a belief that, that took place there. All of the things that led up to the, the TV. Da, da, da. I mean, he had to create a whole narrative to even communicate that you know I, you know what I just did. I'm just like, come on, what? Let's get with it. What are you trying to tell me? Yeah. Yeah. But I got to paint the story so that it doesn't look so bad. So I mean, you just never know. You just yeah, know. yeah, yeah. So, um, and I think that that's why what what triggered that that um, remembrance for me. So, and and then so with unfinished business with your family. If so, list the reasons that prevent you from healing your family relationships. The mm -hmm. the next one, and, and I just want to finish these so that tomorrow we can start off clean with chapter two in the second mm -hmm. chakra. Um, the, the next question is list all the blessings that you feel came from your family. Whew, oh, right? Yeah. I mean, ah. and you can keep an ongoing list, right? Yes. Just start <laughs> off with some. And then continuously add to those because I, you know, I think that we don't always get the insight or or immediately know all of the blessings that come. But as they come up, then you can add to that list. And if you are keeping like a journal or a notebook, that's a perfect place to do it. If you are now raising a family of your own, list the qualities that you would like your children to learn from you. Okay right? What qualities do you want your children to learn from you? What tribal traditions and rituals do you continue for yourself and your family? What tribal traditions and rituals do you continue for yourself and for your family? I know when my, um, when my mom died and when, well, my mother and my grandmother, um, they were not that far apart, but um, there was a lot of stuff that we still tried to hold on to that was made it more difficult because when your matriarch is gone, um, a lot of the stuff that they do or have done um, falls on to who's next, you know? Right, right. Um, and families figure that out because you, you do carry on, you do carry on these traditions. And while even like, um, like there was a certain things we did at Memorial Day, girl, I am not one to go to a cemetery, right? But my grandmother, man, not only did we have to have a jar of water and a towel to clean off the headstones and flowers to put on the graves and all that stuff, child, whatever. <laughs> we have a different understanding today. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, describe your tribal characteristics within yourself that you would like to strengthen and develop. Right. What are those things within yourself that you'd like to strengthen and develop? All right. So with that, um, we are at the bottom of the hour. I am so um, I'm so honored. To have you back, Stephanie. I am glad to be back. And I am glad to have had this. I feel like this book was a setup by the divine for me yes, for yes. this journey that I'm having right now. So I am so ooh, all of this, right? Whether we're talking about the, the phone call that you made and the, you know, oh, I'm doing, you know, like, yeah, right. Yeah, all of it just seems like it just. And so, I, so I got my sisters saying, you know, because that my favorite line is, "Oh my God, my life is so magical. It's just so magical. Like every day, there's these miracles that are just happening all around me." So yes. in the van, you hear one or two of my sisters going, "My life is magical." I'm like, "Get it? Get it? It's magical. It's magic. It's happening all over the place." But yeah, sisters it's are awesome. <laughs> is really uh yeah so yeah I just feel so set up like yes um yeah. I can imagine living like this for the rest of my life so That's yeah true. it's good it's good so thank you for introducing that thank you for saying yes and thank you for picking up the phone that day 
Yes, thank you. I am so, look, I am always so humbled and so like appreciative of all of this. So Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah, it's it's my honor, my pleasure. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad. All right, everybody. I'm glad that you have a blessed and amazing Monday. Journey. Yes. Yes, yes we yes. are. We just just love you and appreciate you. So thank mm. you so much. Mm-hmm. Be here same time tomorrow. All right. Have a great day. Uh, yeah. You too, babe. Mm-hmm. See ya.